beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Day one heaven without us, Jesus, you ride heaven down. Sin was great, your love was greater. Welcome you all to our service this morning. Um, I'll just give you guys a chance to greet your neighbor around you. Hundred and sixty-five years of us gathering as a church. That is amazing. It's amazing to see the different generations. You know, for me it's it's to be able to worship under the same roof as my own parents, my siblings, um, my cousins, and then my grandparents as well. Uh, or my parents and my grandparents, and I just think that's amazing. Um, so 165 years of that um, in the old building. Um, I think we met at some other places as well. Um, uh, for the, the verse this morning, it's been kind of on my heart for perseverance, um, and maybe the last couple of weeks, uh, so I chose Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at a proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give, give up. Um, I know Paul went through his own challenges when he wrote this. Um, he 
throughout his ministry, and he received a great harvest because of his faith. Um, we got to keep continuing. Um, I'll just pray. Lord, I just pray a blessing on this church. Lord, 165 years is a long time to me, and that's just amazing. Um, help us to keep doing good uh, for you, Lord, and as a church, um, we, we can all be blessed as that. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. And we'll sing our uh, second song, King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the Praise forever to the King. 
may be seated. Hello. 
morning. Okay. Um, so this morning's scripture reading is from Hebrews 12, um, verses 1 to 3. Um, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd, cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and, sorry, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such an opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Well, thank you, Jenny, and praise team for leading us in worship, and thank you for AV team for all your background support and making it possible for us to hear this morning. An old Catholic priest led a worship service early every morning. He was asked once if many had attended on a certain day. Well, with a twinkle in his eyes, he answered, Oh yes, millions, but I could only see three of them. So he, of course, had in mind the first verse of Hebrews 12. After listing, if you could help me advance to the next slide. Well, maybe not quite there yet. Yeah, yeah, there, great. So after listing men and women who boldly lived by faith but have died, The writer concludes, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and then then he gives a challenge. So last week, we worked through two questions about life after death from our sermon suggestion box. The one, the person who submitted them, was reflecting on conversations that she had had with others. So, okay, now with that slide, awesome. So she says, my loved one died. Again, this is reflecting on other discussions with others. My loved one died. Is he a star in the sky? Is he an angel? Is he sleeping? Can he see what we're doing? So the first questions are about our humanity. Who will we be after we die? And so last week, we spent much of our time in the first three chapters of Genesis and in 1 Corinthians 15, looking at our purpose and our destiny as human beings. Do we become stars or angels after we die? No. Jesus, the only uncreated Son of God, he became human, was crucified, and defeated death so that we can become all we were meant to be as human beings created in the image of God through Jesus transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. The day is coming when King Jesus will return to earth. Paul describes it in in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but, and he's speaking about death here. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So the dead in Christ, those who have put their faith and trust in him as their Savior and Lord, the dead in Christ will rise. Believers who are still alive on that day will join them. Together, we will receive our resurrection bodies. And so today, we wait. And and like John in the final chapter of the Bible, we pray, come Lord Jesus. We are waiting for his personal bodily return to earth. Well, what does this mean, though, for those who have already died? Where are they now? 
what does the Bible tell us about their experience before the return of Christ? Are they sleeping? Can they see what we're doing? What does the book of Hebrews mean when it says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses? Now, many find comfort in the idea that their departed loved ones are in some way present with us or can see us from heaven. Uh, David Strawman was 25 years old, working at a Christian camp. His faith in Jesus was strong. At the ropes course, he was struck by lightning and died instantly. His parents, Burton and Irene, they were obviously broken by this. And, and they wrote a book called Five Cries of Grief, One Family's Journey to Healing After the Tragic Death of a Son. Now, Merton recalls encouragement from a friend who had also lost a son. Like many, he read Hebrews 12 and pictured past generations who knew and loved Jesus sitting in the stands of eternity, watching us run our marathon, rooting for us, as we follow our Savior. So his friend told him, he said it would be far more difficult if we could not believe that our sons are part of that great bleacher company. The cloud of witness is now cheering us on from the other side. Well, that resonated with Merton. At their family dinner, the first Christmas after his son's death, this is how he prayed. He said, Father in heaven, David's chair stands empty. His plate carries no food. He's with you, with the angels, with the many loved ones who are part of the great cloud of witnesses looking at us from the other side of life. In the midst of our tears, we cling fiercely to your word. And because we do, we believe David continues to live, to serve, to sing, to talk, to remember, to see, and significantly to love us still. Though our eyes cannot see him, oh God, we believe he sees us hears us, loves us more than ever. Give us an increased sense of reality as to his presence with us. Well, that word surrounded, it does imply a nearness or presence, doesn't it? But but consider that great group. What is it that they witness? Does their gaze fall on us or somewhere else? The writer of Hebrews, as you look at the previous chapter, highlights their faith, their witness to the Lord God, to his trustworthiness. Each of them points to him. Hebrews 11 verse 4 says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he's dead. So by offering God his best, Abel declared that his creator is worthy. His testimony still speaks to us today. He is a witness who turns our attention to God. So so speaking of this great cloud in Hebrews 12, F.F. Bruce suggests it's not so much they who look at us as we who look to them (laughs) for encouragement. Still, so so this this passage, it's, it's very easy um, and this is the case with lots of scripture. It's, all, it's, it's very easy to read more into it than what <laughs> the, the scripture writer intended. And now still, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that this multitude also cheers us on in our marathon with Jesus. In Christ, we are certainly united with them spiritually. Since the fourth century, Christians have called this the communion of saints. So by faith, of course, Paul writes in Passages like like 1 Corinthians 12, by faith we become part of the body of Christ. All who are in Christ, whether living or dead, share an everlasting spiritual union with him. 
and with each other. There's, there's this spiritual bond that's ours when we submit ourselves to Jesus. The, the, the cloud of witnesses keeps growing. Those listed in Hebrews 11 played a special role in salvation history, but, but they're not alone. God gives every generation, including us, it's time to testify to Jesus Christ and to create a legacy of encouraging believers in their day and also those not yet born. We're especially mindful of this today, aren't we? Right? As we celebrate 165 years as a congregation, the witness of those who came before us, like the saints of he in Hebrews 11, challenges us to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Sometimes a Bible passage doesn't answer our questions quite the way we might hope, right? There's, in my mind, a bit of an open question there around whether those who have passed might see us. Does, does the Bible speak more directly about the state of God's people after they die, as they await their resurrection? Well, let's turn to Mark 12. The Sadducees were a faction um, among the Jewish people at the time of Jesus. They did not believe in a resurrection. So some groups, like the, the Pharisees, certainly did and actually had a whole lot more in common in terms of their, uh, um, what Jesus taught than, than we might imagine. But the Sadducees, they, they didn't believe really in a supernatural realm at all, and they did not believe in a resurrection. They posed a question to Jesus about seven brothers who each die in turn after having married the same woman, right? It's a bit of an extreme case they put out there. <laughs> and then they, as part of his answer, Jesus says, Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, so this, that's in Exodus chapter 3, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jesus adds then, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. So the patriarchs of Israel were long dead and buried when the Lord spoke to Moses. And still, Jesus points out, the Lord referred to them in the present tense. The Lord had established a relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Death could not end it. It cannot end it. Whatever questions we have about their experience before Jesus returns, they're clearly alive. There's no biblical reason to think it would be different for followers of Jesus as we await resurrection day. Let's turn to Luke 23. Jesus here is on the cross between two thieves. One mocks him. But the other criminal rebuked him, rebuked the mocker. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. So it's, it's remarkable. The second thief sees clearly. He sees his own guilt, and he also sees the innocence of Jesus. What convinced him? How, how does he know that the man crucified between them is not a criminal, but is wholly righteous? Was it his cry, Father, forgive them? Or they do not know what they're doing. What, was it a look from Jesus? Or the quality of his voice? Well, we don't know exactly, but somehow the Holy Spirit opened the eyes of his heart 
to recognize a Savior, to see Jesus, at least in some measure, for who he is. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Have you ever prayed like that? Jesus, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. Have you ever cried out to Jesus for salvation? And how does Jesus answer the criminal who honestly confesses his wrongdoing, who recognizes him as king? And he speaks of his kingdom. Right? There's faith there. And begs him for salvation. How does Jesus answer? Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today. Now in scripture, paradise is the garden of God. Not just Eden long past, but an image of his new creation. The promise is personal. You will be with me. In 2 Corinthians 12, we're, we're jumping around to lots of passages this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul speaks of a vision that he was once given of paradise. He uses the same word. Now he's hesitant to boast about his spiritual experiences, so he writes as if it happened to someone else. I will go on, he says, to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ... He's speaking about himself here. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Third heaven. What's he speaking of? So we tend not to speak quite like that. So we, we wonder, are there like multiple layers of heaven? Or like It raises all kinds of questions for us. But it's, it's helpful for us to know, I think, that for Jewish people, the word heaven could describe the sky where the birds fly and clouds form. But it could also refer to that area above our atmosphere where we see the sun, moon, and stars, what we sometimes call outer space, right? So you could consider these first heaven and second heaven. So Paul seems here to use the term third heaven to describe a place different from these two visible realms, to speak about this unseen territory in the presence of God. And he adds, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, right? So, so there's a mystery about what Paul has experienced. He, he doesn't, doesn't fully understand. He's upfront about that. He goes on, and I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, <laughs> was caught up in paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. So Paul uses the word paradise and third heaven in this passage to describe the same reality. It doesn't seem like he's speaking about our final eternal destiny, the new heaven and the new earth, in which all who are saved by Jesus enjoy life in immortal, imperishable bodies. Right? We spoke about those resurrection bodies last week, especially kind of as Paul, Paul describes that in 1 Corinthians 15. But here it seems like an, an in-between or an intermediate state. Right? It can be hard a little bit to know what, what are the best words to talk about this. And yet... What Paul describes here and what Jesus promised the thief on the cross when he said, today you will be with me in paradise. This is so incredibly good, right? Far beyond our very best experiences in this world. What's most important, right? We have all kinds of questions that we bring to this, but what's most important for us to know is that we will be with Jesus, Writing to the Philippians, Paul describes an inner tension. This is in first chapter to Philippians, starting in verse 21. He says, For to me, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am 
to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Like, that's good. <laughs> Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Do you identify with him in this? Do you feel that pull between staying at your post and being with Christ? Right? So for as long as we are in this body, God has a mission for us, a purpose for us. It's, it's normal for uh, our thoughts and feelings about this to shift at different stages of life. So typically, when we're younger, I mean, we, we see what's be before us and and. and and we respond to the call of God, and there's an excitement about that, and there's a richness to life, and that is God-given, right? He has made us to want to make the very most of this time he's given us, and as long as we have life and breath. But it's not uncommon for believers as they age, especially as they lose loved ones who are close to them and experience the limits of, of their bodies failing, it's not uncommon and it's for, for that, that longing for heaven to, to increase. And of course, we're all, we're all wired a little bit differently. We all have different life experiences with that. And so the nature of this tension can look differently. So sometimes in accounts of people who, who've passed away and maybe received a vis some vision of heaven, maybe a bit like Paul did here, you know, we'll often describe this intense desire to be with the Lord, and some are even annoyed that they, they were that their hearts got going again, and and that they came back to life and need again to rediscover this purpose and mission God has for them today. Anyway, there are all kinds of experiences around this. Thankfully, it's not ours to decide. Despite Canada's medical assistance in dying. Uh, legislation, that's another sermon, really. But despite that, God, our, our times are in his hands. God is sovereign. He designed us to relish life, to make the most of our time in this prelude to eternity that we are given. And yet, what is to come next is better by far, Paul says being with Christ. So do loved ones who have died, do they sleep as they await the resurrection? When Lazarus died, Jesus told his disciples, this is in John 11, Jesus told his disciples that his friend had fallen asleep. That's a metaphor for death. So Paul uses the word sleep in the same way, recognizing that for those who belong to Jesus, it's a temporary uh, situation. Now, from our perspective, as, as people in our time, we can imagine departed believers sleeping until they awaken at the dawn of Jesus' return. And yet, what does Jesus tell the thief on the cross? Today, <laughs> you will be with me in paradise. It does not sound like he's going to be experiencing a delay. Now, there's something else to consider. You know, what does today mean for the person who's died? So in our experience as human beings, until we take our last breath, our experience, all we know is bound by the confines of, of time and space in this creation, right? So we, we locate ourselves with maps, in terms of where we are in, in um, kind of in the geography of this world, and we locate ourselves in time through calendars and, and clocks. So, so that's our frame of reference. From our vantage point, the return of Jesus and the resurrection of his people is at some unknown day in the future. But what's it like for departed believers? Are they bound by time as we are? Now, I doubt it. Uh, I need to, need to be careful.
helpful here, right? Because scripture does not make this explicit, right? And it can be easy to try to fill in gaps that go beyond scripture. And yet, based on all of the promises of God, all the testimony of scripture, I certainly do not imagine those believers impatiently twiddling their thumbs, anxious for the arrival of that final day. So whether in their experience, they they get to experience some, um, it's a stretch of time, that even there, the word time is not probably not quite the right word to use. They have some kind of experience of the presence of Jesus that precedes his return, or whether in their experience, they're, you know, because they've stepped out of time, they are at resurrection day. I don't know. Hardly want to speculate. I don't want to speculate, though it's tempting. <laughs> Can they see us? Well, there's so much we can't understand at our place in eternity. We know that they, they're, they're going to be in the presence of Jesus, which will be the dominant reality in their lives. Certainly their, their attention will be on him, but there's so much we don't understand about their experience at, at our place here in eternity. Still, in Revelation 14, verse 13, John writes, and he, again, the Lord gave him this vision, a re- re- revelation of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 14, 13, John writes, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed are they. Can we rest in that? Not having all the answers, but knowing the promise of Jesus that we will be with him. Now, it is tragically different, of course, for those who do not die in the Lord. We cannot take our eternal destiny for granted. As as human beings, we have all fallen into sin. Jesus is the only exception. And, And we know from God's word that sin creates a barrier that separates us from our holy God. Last week, I I shared phrases that the Bible uses to describe our condition at the end of this life if we have not accepted the forgiveness of God that he offers to us in Christ Jesus and if if we've not been restored to him through the blood of Christ. Sin leads us to perish, to hell to being thrown into a place of darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, to where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched, to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, to eternal punishment, to everlasting destruction, shutting us out from the presence of the Lord, to a lake of fire or burning sulfur, to a place of torment. Each of those phrases comes from a different scripture passage that, that addresses our lostness apart from the incredible sacrifice of Jesus for us and our receiving of salvation. The tiniest glimpse of that reality reveals just how amazing it is that Jesus came into this world not to condemn us, but with the gospel. The time has come, he says in Mark 1 verse 15, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. He does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance and receive his abundant, everlasting life. Have you answered his call? Have you surrendered to him in faith? Have you let him 
take your sin and exchange it for his righteousness, do you have confidence that nothing, not even death, can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Can you rejoice today with Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 where he says, death has been swallowed up in victory. Father, we thank you that when you created us in your image, male and female, when you formed us from the dust of this earth and breathed your life into us, we thank you for the great love and purpose that you had for us and continue to have for us. Thank you that when we followed Adam and Eve into sin, that you did not abandon us to our choices, but pursued us. Did you call the people for yourself? Israel, in the Old Testament, called to reveal your goodness and character to the world, and that you deposited your promises into them through their history, culminating in the sending of your son, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you that he who is without sin became sin for us on the cross. Lord, you know each one of us here. You know where we're at in our relationship with you. And so, Lord, we we pray that your Holy Spirit would, would meet us if we've already surrendered to you and we've already know you and have experienced the joy of salvation. We pray, Lord, that you would you would deepen our experience of that, enabling us to grow as your disciples giving us clearer vision about the amazing kingdom that you lead us into. Lord, but if any of us have not yet surrendered to you, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would give, that would impart the grace to be able to do that, that you would give birth to genuine faith, that you would give courage to confess sin, and to repent of it. That by your grace, you would enable each one to be born again. That each would be an heir of that incredible kingdom of the new heaven and the new earth. And even even in death, so that even in death, with the things that aren't completely clear to us, we'd have confidence of being with you and knowing that nothing in this creation, not even death, can separate them from you. Thank you that you are good. We pray in Jesus' name. If you are uncertain about your relationship with God, please talk to someone who you know knows him and can lead you to a place of confidence in your relationship with him. He can pray with you and encourage you. Um, I, anyone on our ministry team, and many, many others in this congregation would love to have that conversation with you. God is moving in our midst. He is at work.